Okay, well, just to welcome everybody back for those who have decided to stay for some additional question and answers in that Q&A period. Um, Mark and I are excited to engage with you and if any of our speakers um, have managed to stay on <laughs> uh, while having some lunch, that's totally fine. Um, that's great. <clears throat> uh, we're going to spend the next little bit uh, just working through some of the additional questions that have come in. Um, next slide, please. So uh, just as a reminder, if you're just joining us, um, I want to make sure you know that um, <clears throat> the recordings from today will be available um, on the HeartLife website um, and we will disseminate them. We will send you links to them um, by email if you registered um, to the webinar and we'll just, or we will make sure that you get access to all of the information. Uh, similarly, um, any of the slides, all of that stuff will be made available for you to refer to. So um, not to worry about if there was a book that you were really excited about. There's several comments already about what Colleen mentioned um, and all of the links and resources um, from all of the presentations. So if you do have a Q any questions, please um, use the Q&A button down below and ask away. Next slide, please. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you to our sponsors, <laughs> um, especially the Canadian Heart Failure Society for um, their undying support, um, without whom we wouldn't be here um, on many fronts. Uh, we, wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't be alive, we wouldn't have the treatments we do, we wouldn't um, uh, have ha have the platform we do today to be able to um, meet and and speak with each other and of course to our um, industry sponsors below next slide please um, also wanted to just emphasize again if you haven't already uh, joined um, our Facebook group um, heart life Canada help for hearts um, through the through the the Facebook link there, but even if you just search for Heart Life Canada in um, in Facebook, you will find it. Also on our website, if you go to heartlife.ca um, and and subscribe to our mailing list, we will make sure that um, you get all the up to date information. And so I think we can leave it there. And let's go to the questions. Mark, do you want to take a take a yeah, question? definitely. Um... First question was uh, for Colleen from the uh, first workshop. Uh, thank you so much, Colleen. I found this session very useful. How do we find the right, right person slash a counselor for us in our local community? Oh, that's a terrific question. Thank you, Mark. Um, research has shown that what is most important in making progress in feeling better with a therapist or counselor is that personal connection. And so finding someone that you feel comfortable with um, is really important. And I say that to folks because it breaks my heart when I hear people say, oh, I went to somebody once and uh, I, didn't, I didn't trust them. So I didn't, I, you know, I've never gone back. I've never tried it again. I often encourage people to think of it as almost like uh, finding your own family physician where different providers have very different styles and one thing might work well for person A and not so well for person B. Uh, my personal physician has atrocious interpersonal skills. It is an amazing technician. So, but I wouldn't go to him for his bedside manner, but he, I want him to be a really good technician and so that works. So very similarly, somebody might be looking, and you might not even know until you get there. That's totally fine. But you might find that you would prefer a more structured style where you feel like you're actually working through a series of steps to achieve certain goals, or you might find that you prefer more of a relaxed, informal, come as you will, <laughs> you know, today you're upset about taxes, to the next time you're upset about your kid, the next time you're upset about um, being really fearful. And uh, so different people and different therapists will be a good fit or not so good a fit on that front. Also, you can feel free to give your, your counselor or therapist that feedback. Often we'll just jump in with the style that we think makes sense. And when someone says, you know, actually I'm looking for a little more structured, or I've had someone say to me, you know, in the last 10 minutes, could we write a list of specific things I should do this week? And getting that feedback was terrific because that's not something I would have normally done. 
That being said, I do recommend that you start by checking with regulated healthcare professionals. These days, it's so confusing for um, the public because there are coaches, there are you know wellness influences, influencers. There's every terminology you can imagine. Some of those folks might be terrific at being able to help you. The advantage of going with somebody who's regulated and is a member of a college is that if they do something that is um, harmful to you, there's um, you have some protection. So if I was hurting clients, absolutely, I could be reported to my college. My college would be would investigate, and I could be reprimanded. So you've got a little bit of that safety when you go to see a regulated provider. So you can check with um, whichever province you're in, unless you're in the Yukon, and Yukon usually refers to BC or Alberta. Um, and actually the other two territories, uh, I would assume would also not have regulatory colleges. So the, co the province you're in or closest to, check with the College of Social Work, check with the College of Psychology, some provinces such as Alberta and BC also have not colleges, but they have regulatory bodies called regular, uh, sorry, registered clinical counselors, or CCs. So those folks have done tons of training, are excellent counselors. And while they don't have a regulatory college, they certainly have a regulatory board that holds them accountable as well. Um, I would type in how to find a therapist in your province. Also, I will just note that most of us as regulated therapists can only see people in the province that we're in. And so uh, I would recommend, let's say you're in Halifax right now, I would start with your province. Like if someone from Halifax wanted to work with me, legally I would be unable to. So if somebody pops up on your screen and says, hey, they're in Missouri and would be help, happy to see you for counseling, odds are they're not a regulated healthcare professional. Doesn't mean they're not a great counselor, but it does mean that you wouldn't have the same protection you would from somebody who's regulated. Thank you so much. Oh, may I also just add to that? Sorry, I of forgot course. one piece. Um, I'm also registered in Alberta. Alberta has a great uh, access mental health line. I'm sorry, I don't remember right now. It's been nine years uh, for me. But if you Google mental health services in the name of your province, some of provinces do have, so they'll have like a one-stop place where you can call in and give a sense of what it is. Maybe you have a child uh, who has autism. Maybe you want to speak to a therapist about anxiety and they can help direct you as well. Perfect. No, thank you so much. It's a long answer. It's a great question. Yeah, um, it's a great answer. <laughs> excellent answer. Thanks. Gordon, uh, this, this question is for you. Um, and uh, you know, I know a few people have actually asked this question before as well. I was in great shape before uh, my heart failure. Uh, this person specifically was the fitness instructor. How do you convince yourself to trust your body again? Or how do you begin to trust your body again? Yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, and I, I work, the, the largest chunk of the population I work with actually is coming uh, more recently out of heart attacks. And uh, similar to heart failure, uh, a lot of people may have been put on new medications, so there there can sometimes be really significant changes in how you experience exercise, your energy. The the beta blockers in particular tend to kind of really slow down your heart rate or limit kind of how high it can go. Um, they're they're certainly important medications, but they they do require a little bit of adjustment to um, just kind of the new normal, basically. Um, so. I think probably one of the, the best ways you can start to get back into the swing of things, start to rediscover activities that you may have previously enjoyed is to, again, sort of, you know, check with your doctor, obviously, uh, to make sure there aren't any reasons you shouldn't do them, but uh, to kind of start light. Again, moving back to that balancing caution and confidence, um, a lot of people, become accustomed to their old ways of doing things, whether that's sedentary behavior, uh, it tends to sort of pull people back, whether it's uh, exercise. We tend to almost think of ourselves, you know, oh, I did a lot of exercise when I was 20. I used to love, you know, going cycling or running marathons or whatever. And we have kind of that image in our head of this is what exercise is to me. Um, unfortunately, the, the clock doesn't stop ticking for anybody. And it is important to kind of 
adapt your goals as you move along and, and sort of what the expectations are. Um, you know, for for good reason, partly to avoid yourself from feeling disappointed when we set a goal that's maybe overly ambitious and then fall short. Uh, so I guess a roundabout way of explaining things, but the, the Coles notes would be to just start light, uh, really focus on what you're able to do now um, and, you know, follow the guidelines and, and suggestions that we went through earlier to just start doing what you can do now. Uh, and then gradually add a little bit, a little bit, you know, over weeks, months, years. Uh, and over, over that time, as you kind of get used to it and see yourself doing more and more exercise, hopefully that sense of trust will, um, will start to resume. Um, if, if those feelings of uncertainty, uh, if you're experiencing a lot of really disruptive fear, then, you know, uh, I definitely encourage you to potentially check out some of those counseling resources as well, because, um, you know, it's normal after something new has happened uh, to experiencing, to, you know, go through some of those uh, concerns and feelings like fear, anger, uh, things like that. It's incredibly common. Um, but hopefully over time, some of those feelings should kind of lessen. And, uh, and again, you just get used to like what you're able to do now and, and what you might be able to do tomorrow. Oh, perfect. No, th thank you, Gordon. I uh, appreciate okay. that. And, and just to, to add uh, on the Heart and Stroke website, there is a uh, one-stop kind of um, uh, page there on their resource page for crisis lines listed by province. So you can head to the Stroke website and they have uh, the services on, on their services and resource page. There are the uh, lines for uh, all provinces and territories. So you can check that out as well. Absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to follow up on actually, which builds on this question and the connection between um, having to build trust in your body again. Um, what is often we often talk about is also or we often find is that my body betrayed me and there's there's a whole cycle mm -hmm. of this that happens every time you have an additional event or your heart failure de decompensates and and i'm wondering colleen if, if you have anything to add add there about the con that connection with with exercise and the mind body connection entirely yeah, absolutely. And, and Gordon, I really appreciated your, your answer and perspective to you, your field. I don't go near because my fear would be that I would hurt someone, of course. So <laughs> I really appreciate your guidelines. Um, it, you know, I, I think our relationship with our body is just an incredibly private um, world. And when something serious goes wrong with your body, like a heart attack, heart failure, heart disease, it is absolutely normal to, to pretty suddenly feel like you don't know your body and you don't trust your body. And what I say to clients who survive something really terrifying and, and threatening is you've earned that right. You know, if, if, if one day you had this horrible experience with your uh, body or you were diagnosed with a disease and it felt like you were progressively getting worse, I wouldn't tell you for a second to not, not struggle with that because we're, we're used to, we're used to, if we're up all night with the kids, too bad, you go to work the next day. If you have, you know, 50 pounds of feed and you have to get it back in the, in, sorry, 200 pounds of feed and you have to get it in the back of the truck, it won't be pretty, but before the sun goes down, you're getting it in the back of the truck. You know, we're used to just, if you have a headache, you just, um, you know, uh, make dinner anyhow. We're used to just kind of sucking it up and not giving our body a vote. But when something can go so scarily wrong with your body and feel like it's gone so wrong, now, when you have those sensations, what's normal is you associate that with fear and threat and risk and danger. You know, if you wake up in the morning and your, your shoulder is tight, for most of your life, you probably went, oh, yeah, I carried too much yesterday. I overdid it yesterday. I write the leaves too aggressively yesterday. But when you've had a cardiac event or you feel like your um, quality of life and your stamina are going down and you wake up with a sore shoulder, that can mean something totally different. Or you start uh, exercising now as per the guidelines and you start sweating heavily. Well, probably for, let's say 35 years of your life, you would think, oh, it's hot out. <laughs> Whereas now you exercise, you start sweating heavily and it can have a completely different meaning to you. So I would absolutely rely on the direction and advice of professionals like Gordon and, and Moira and Cindy 
to be able to understand what you can safely do and give yourself time and patience for those fears and those to learn new association. Now, now thinking, oh, my shoulder's sore because I had a really great workout yesterday and it's been a long time. So absolutely normal transition to go through. Thank you for that. What other questions we have here, Mark? All right, we have another question. Um, <clears throat> a big thank you for everyone uh, for uh, their presentations. And this individual asks, how do we get more involved with heart life and advocacy in our area? And there, there are many options to get involved. I mean, uh, if there are local initiatives that you want to launch or local, um, I would say, uh, programs in your community that are already out there, and you would like some support in terms of online or advice or traction, you can always reach out to us uh, at heartlife.ca uh, or online through Twitter and Facebook. We also launch uh, campaigns across the country. So local campaigns that we can hold in Vancouver or Winnipeg, for example, we can do in Ottawa, Toronto, and Nova Scotia, anywhere really. Um, so multiple ways to get involved, one through initiatives, one through our online support group. Uh, you can become a mentor or a mentee to others in the same situation. Um, and and even, uh, on, the, on another level, we, we take part in research. We work with Heart and Stroke Foundation on various campaigns. You know, well, in moving forward, a lot of ideas coming from this session, developing mental health resources with Colleen, uh, looking at cardiac rehab with Gordon, all things that we can push forward. So if you have ideas, I encourage you to bring them forward, reach out, and we're always willing to have a conversation. Jillian, I don't know if you want to add to that. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to ask for the next slide. This, I think it's our last slide. Um, it has our info. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, we, we, if we if we can't do it, we can probably connect you with somebody who can, um, or or we will figure out how to um, how to get something done. Um, this is basically how 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 we've operated, and um, it's really important that as a community, as a cardio cardiovascular community across Canada, that that we engage in this kind of action together collectively with our partners through um, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, Canadian Heart Failure Society, other, um, other patient groups out there as well. Um, in addition to our close uh, family-like tie to the Heart and Stroke Foundation, um, who as you, as you are all probably well, well aware, um, has a significant amount of influence um, and advocacy power behind them. So um, they've been very supportive and so, if you reach out um, and want to get engaged, um, there are many ways to do that. And, um, you know, through Heart Life, but also through, um, through Heart and Stroke. And I believe Moira um, is kind of the, uh, in charge of a lot of that, or at least the patient engagement liaison, I think, um, with Heart and Stroke. Um, so if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Moira, please. Sure, thank you, Julianne. Um, absolutely, we do a lot of advocacy work, as you mentioned, and we do partner with people with lived experience to ensure that we're meeting needs and advocating for what matters most to them. Um, we have um, a coalition of health charities we work with as well to help align um, and amplify the voices of, of the many who um, are wanting us to speak out for them. And so if you're interested in being a part of that advocacy or awareness campaigns or even research participation, um, you can reach out um, to us by going to heartandstroke.ca slash connect. And that way you'll receive a newsletter with every engagement opportunity that's available each month. Um, or you could reach out to me directly at engagement um, at heartandstroke.ca uh, for, for an email. So thanks. Yeah, and I just want to jump into that as well. For those who is interested in advocacy, um, many of you may not realize that we do bring people like you to the Parliament Hill with us side by side. Um, to talk to the ministries and the member of parliament. Um, Julian was some of those in, in the past that she was invited and many others, members of Hot Life Foundation as well. 
So if this is something that you are interested in, don't worry, we will provide all the support needed to uh, guide you through how to talk to a MPs um, of different parties. We to talk to all of the parties, whether you're conservative, NDP, liberals, independent, we talk to all of you. And this usually happened in February. So there are lots of opportunity and um, you know, being in person on the Hill is one of them. And I would say, one thing that do resonate very well with a lot of politicians and policymakers is data and your story together. Either one of them alone is useless, but when we put together both of them, um, it's very powerful and then they do listen. So to Mark's point and to Julian's point, you know, um, fill, us, fill in a survey, share your input um, so that we can Amplifies your voice in scientific paper, um, in web content on a respective website and a Twitter channels, um, and then all of those material we put together as a package to talk to the politician and the policymaker on a regular basis. And we would love to bring all of you with us. Thank you, Cindy. Um, there's actually, oh, this is a great question. And one that, um, that I often think about is the, uh, with the workplace. Um, so this person has asked, my workplace is currently coming up with a safe protocol for a return to work. I can do most of my work from home. Given our high risk, um, if infected, I'm not sure um, there is such a thing as a safe workplace with respect to COVID. Given how things seem to change every day, what do you think? Um, this is absolutely something that has uh, that that weighs on my mind um, that that I think about all the time um, and I actually for myself I, um, I I do have the opportunity to work from home um, and so um, at, what a week before everybody else at least a week before everybody else I was staying home um, and my employer was um, the UBC was was very supportive of that arrangement um, I think Given your medical history, um, I think it would be com completely reasonable to request a continuing modification um, for you to work from home. And um, if you haven't disclosed your condition, I'm sure that you could probably get um, uh, some kind of letter or something from your from your family doctor um, to uh, to. Um, provide that kind of uh, support for you. So if you aren't uh, comfortable going back to work, and um, I, I, I think that would be certainly reasonable to ask. Um, what do you think, Mark? Because I know that, that you have experience with this as well. Yeah, I mean, it's for myself, um, being immunosuppressed uh, for, for multiple reasons, the, the back to work question uh, has been on my mind, uh, I would say for the last probably eight weeks uh, and it'll be more prominent in the coming weeks. And I think with your employer, uh, the strategy that I will employ is uh, talking about my situation open and honestly um, and identifying my concerns. And for the most part, if you're able to work at home, um, you know, I would encourage it until the healthcare professionals have said otherwise as it comes to uh, high-risk individuals um, but then you know that's a conversation with both your employer and your healthcare professional uh, I myself uh, have a note from my physician uh, just outlining it uh, so if that's something that you need that's an, always an option to go out and get as well but I mean I, I would I would caution on the on the safe side uh, that's what I'm doing personally um, because I'd rather be safe than sorry at the end of the day absolutely Yes. Um, this one is from earlier today, actually, right off the top. Um, I think it would be for Colleen, actually, since, um, since you're still here. Um, this person wrote, I have been through a traumatic open heart surgery and almost didn't make it. I'm now awaiting a heart transplant. I go through periods of extreme fear. Do I deal with this in the same way as anxiety? Sometimes I go into huge panic attacks and need Ativan to calm down. I don't want to have to do this. Um, sounds like a very similar situation that I have found myself in as well. So what do you, what do you say to that, Colleen? Well, thank, thank you for asking that and thank you for sharing what you have. Um, uh, I'm glad that you found a, an interim strategy with the Ativan that is helping you get by for now. I'm 
in, in full support of that, it can be a great tool. No one wants to take it long term and no one wants you taking it long term. But if it's helping you get through right now, um, good. I would absolutely recommend um, finding somebody that you can talk to or a resource that can help with that level of anxiety. Um, the, the, the nuts and the, the, on the presentation that if you, <laughs> I would absolutely recommend getting more tools to help manage the anxiety and having someone to talk to about the terrible thing you went through and how terrifying and scary it must have been. If you can't find anyone who can teach you the tools, um, the tools I would recommend are um, under anxiety and panic on the third of the three resources that I sent this morning, the Center for Clinical Interventions out of Australia. Also, Anxiety Canada has a pretty great website. Um, and if you're interested, um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Christine Coral, which is K-O-R-O-L, um, has six free YouTube videos uh, online about quieting the anxious mind. And it's specifically around tools to help manage panic and anxiety. That being said, I certainly hope that you can find somebody to talk to to help reinforce those skills and teach you those skills and work on them with you as well. I believe in skills, but I also believe on being able to talk about something awful that just happened. And so hopefully my answer earlier gave you some suggestions for finding somebody uh, to talk to um, in addition to the skills. On a day-to-day -day level, literally this afternoon, working on things like the breathing techniques can be extremely helpful. Learning to, the three pillars are learning to calm your body and mind, learning to catch, identify, and alter problematic thinking patterns, and working on changing your behavior to move forward instead of getting into cycles of fear and avoidance. So skills, if you have to online, and absolutely finding somebody you can talk to in person. You're in good company. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you so much. Um, just as a quick follow up to that, um, the doc, Dr. Wayne um, Sotel's book, do you yes. have the, the title of that book? What was the yes. title of it? Uh, thank you. I saw that in the thread. It's called Thriving with Heart Disease. And I was Googling it during our break, which is why you caught me eating lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, it's a, it's, it's, my version is even older than 2003. It looks, based on Dr. Google, like the last time he, he published it was in 2003. So I would use caution, of course, at the end. He talks, there are chapters where he talks about the medications. And that's going to be 20-year-old information at this point. But the chapters before that that are all about me thriving, it's deliberately a provocative title to talk about the fact that many people, when they're initially diagnosed, of course, describe heart disease as being absolutely devastating. But within a few years, many people say, in some ways, it's changed their life for the better. Being able to focus on their values, being able to say no, feeling like they have permission to say no, um, uh, simplifying and not multitasking, like this frantic life that, that many people are pulled into. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say about uh, his book, and Thriving with Heart Disease. Oh, yes, there's also a chapter on sex. And when I would uh, teach groups in Calgary, um, uh, with stress management and psychology, I would mention his book and people would, you know, sort of not really open it. And then when I would mention that there's a chapter on sex, I swear to God, the book falls open to that page now. So people would pass it around and that would be the chapter they'd be checking out. <laughs> um, it can be something that's really hard to talk about and really important to talk about. Um, and he's, he's, you'll be giggling as you read through it. He does a great job. That's fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. He's a delight. Wonderful. Um, just looking through some additional questions here. Uh, oh, another one. Um, this, uh, lots of questions for Colleen. How can you tell that your services are, are needed? Yeah, how do you, um, not me, it's the underfunding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this person says, is it normal to go from zero to 60 in anger at my husband? Whereas before I didn't do that, it's causing problems between us and are going to seek couples counseling. Good. Great. But is this something that is common in heart failure patients? Oh, thank you so much for asking this question. Yeah, usually, um, you know, we, there, we differ person to person based on personality and situations. But generally for each of us, our emotions stay in a certain range. So there'll be a difference in range from person to person. 
But, you know, if I look at the last 20 years of my life, my emotions have stayed in this range as of yours. There's something about having something go awry with your heart that changes that. And that's referred to as difficulties with um, emotional, regulating your emotional, your emotions becomes more difficult, otherwise known as emotional dysregulation, DYS. It's harder to keep your emotions, the, the filters that help you keep those emotions in that range don't work as well. So people will talk about being more volatile. They'll say, you know, I couldn't find a parking space and I was ranting in the parking lot. Before I would have been annoyed, now I'm ranting. As you point out, the people closest to us often notice this very directly. And something they, something that your husband might have done before that's kind of hurtful can now feel absolutely devastating. That tends to get better with time. Being aware of it's really important. And as I call it, damage control. So not letting that snowball. So it's great you're going to go talk to a marriage therapist in the meanwhile. Um, absolutely, I believe that the, the, the overwhelming reason why it's happening we don't know we don't know the physiology behind but it's absolutely related to what you've been through with your heart uh, similarly somebody um, had asked earlier about um, crying so I uh, you know okay. on the, per, perhaps on the same spectrum um, or on the other uh, side of the coin depending on which yes. which uh, camp you're in um, yep. but you know um, similarly with with crying and extreme sadness yes people talk about not being able to get through a commercial not being able to get through a movie I, absolutely the mind and the body are connected in my lifetime we'll never figure out that pathway and to me it doesn't doesn't really matter what the pathway is it matters that it's real it's normal and to not not remember the, the graph i showed with the four circles to not let your thoughts run with that like i'm broken uh, i'm damaged goods um, i'm never going to feel better i'm not going never going to feel normal i'm never going to feel like the old me don't let those thoughts win those anxious self-critical thoughts are bullies and don't let them have a field day right now. Your, your uh, emotional dysregulation is, is as important a symptom as your blood pressure. It's just invisible, <laughs> which is so hard. I wish I could take your blood level and talk to you about, oh, looks like, looks like you're gonna have a more tearful day on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, psychology doesn't work that way. Just try not to let it snowball into, you'll leave my marriage, I'm gonna leave my home, I'm gonna quit my job, I never wanna to talk to my boss again. This isn't that time, this isn't the time to let those thoughts run. This is just the time to say, wow, I'm having a hard day, I'm gonna have a big cry, and watch some comedy. Whatever 27 things you're doing to cope right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I find I'm finding lots of coping mechanisms these days <laughs> as we all are i'm sure mm -hmm. um here's another one and this one's about memory and so i think i think it's it's definitely related um i'm waiting a uh, transplant i have a terrible memory since this all started uh forget conversations things to do it frust uh, forgetting conversations things to do etc it frustrates and, and angers me is this normal and I think this is also related to what Cindy and I were, were um, talking about as well. Um, I don't, Cindy, if you want to, if you want to jump in on this as well, um, or Colleen, you want to start or what do you think? Uh, why don't I just make a quick point and then I, I will defer to my distinguished colleagues and stop hearing the sound of my own voice. Um, <laughs> uh, you mentioned in your question that you're struggling with your memory and then you get frustrated, annoyed, uh, being frustrated, and annoyed, actually makes your memory worse. So remember those double-sided arrows? And so understanding that it's perfectly normal to be struggling with your memory and that all the emotions that come with that then sort of double down and make that worse, that it's really important to try to be patient with yourself and use some of those basic tools. Like I've had people say, I raised four kids, I ran a company, I moved across the country, uh, country three times and now you're telling me to use sticky notes? Yes. Yes, I am. I'm telling you to use sticky notes, make a list, set a timer on your phone or your watch or on the stove, um, give your memory a break because the frustration of struggling with your memory makes your memory worse. All of us. It happens for all of us. Okay, I'm officially stopping talking now. No, that's a very good question and very, a lot of great points, Colleen. And, and to your point of sticky notes, right? Just, just to stick to it. I got lots of sticky notes myself. So... Um, I think it really goes back to the point and Jillian's and Mark's point is, you know, find that community to figure out whether, you know, other people feel the same way because 
by knowing that you are not alone. Um, this is part of the journey. Um, we'll take away the frustration and then you can get um, to a, even a loop of, of frustration, stress, um, then further impact to make the memory even worse. Right? So I think it's starting the challenge, understanding of this part of the, the, the journey of being a um, being diagnosed with heart failure. And together, then you can find coping mechanisms to make your quality of life better. And so I can together, and I'm sure Bob can speak to you a little bit of the, you know, experience as well, because you can share a story and, and be uh, a conversation, for example. Um, you know, how to help with that and, and use people like a brain coach to, to help improve your memory and how to handle that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and just just to add to that, Cindy, uh, you know, using a brain coach, you know, you know, you and I have talked about that before, and uh, I, I used a brain coach in the past, and uh, we actually had uh, Mr. Justin Nope on our Facebook do a live session on just that memory. Um, you know, when I uh, threw out heart failure uh, and then post transplant, Jillian uh, knows this. I I struggled with my cognitive ability and my memory. And so uh, he, he provided a lot of useful and uh, effective tips that uh, you can implement now to help improve that memory, uh, both short term and long term. And, you know, for mm -hmm. me, it was as much about the memory as it was about my mental health uh, and that heart brain connection of just feeling better about what I was doing and achieving. And so you can definitely go on to our Facebook and there's a recording of that video as well. Yes. Yes, it was a it was an excellent session. Um, I have a feeling we're probably going to be doing some more mental health sessions coming up. Um, one thing I do want to add as well, though, um, one of the from my own personal experience, one of the factors, um, as Colleen was saying about you know our mental health is it is a symptom as much as anything else, and so is our memory and our and our cognitive ability, and so. Um, when I was you know I'm used to functioning well now I'm functioning at you know. <laughs> A decrease level but um, what I was used to functioning at and I noticed there was changes in my ability to function um, it wasn't just an emotional or, or psychological impact it did act actually I think um, sig signal a physiological change in what was happening in my body especially since you're waiting for transplant um, I would encourage you to report that as a symptom as well for myself um, it did indicate that my my condition had um, um, had decompensated some more and so my team decided to take some further action there and so it is really important that um, that you do all of the things that we've talked about but it is important very important to report that to your team yeah and maybe sometimes what I've heard that has been useful to people um, is to have a little book and have a little di diary because it's easy to just forget and by the time you're struggling with that 10, 15 minutes appointment with your doctor, um, it's hard to string all those thoughts together because there's so many questions for them. So having a diary, bring it with you. Sometimes you may forget to say it, but they may actually see it. It's like, did I see this word, you know, anxiety in your book? Can we talk about this? It may just prompt, again, being an informed individual so that you can help the health teams as well. Yeah, that's excellent point, Cindy. Um, further to like functioning on a daily basis, um, I started a while ago, I started going through, a, you know, having a journal, but then I, I, there was a specific mechanism or uh, it's called bullet journaling. And um, if you Google bullet journaling, you'll see people, you know, creating all these beautiful, amazing journals. But the original um, uh, inventor of that method, his name is Ryder Carroll. And um, he actually uh, um, is uh, a high functioning autistic individual. And so he created this as a way for him to help, um, you know, keep uh, keep control of his thoughts, or just you know, a way to put everything down on paper. Um, and it's been an excellent tool for me to keep track of the things that um, that I want to remember. So I put it on, you know, on a sticky note. Is you know the same as having a little notebook and putting it in there. And then that way um, you can, you know, hopefully lessen some of that frustration. Um, about being forgetful all, all the time and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff as well. So that's just um, one tip is there too. So 
Do we have any more questions here, Mark? I think we might have gotten these ones. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there was one about blood pressure, actually, um, about um, this individual's high blood pressure. Where do I get this measured now that everything is closed? That's an excellent question. Um, one thing that it might be useful to invest in, um, and they come in a um, lot of different uh, shapes and sizes um, and uh, prices. Um, some are quite economical, is a home monitoring, um, so a, a blood pressure uh, cuff and kit yourself. Um, so you can get it on Amazon. Um, you should be able to get them at your local pharmacy, which should still be open. Um, careful when you go out, if, if you do go out or send somebody to um, go and have a look at, at them for you. Um, but it might be a good idea to just kind of keep an eye on that yourself. And then that way you can monitor your, um, your own blood pressures. Um, but it, you know, if if you do find that it's that it's spiking and that kind of stuff, um, do be in touch with your doctor, um, and um, and a a nurse, um, or you know, use the uh, the the eight one one line, um, or um, whatever the uh, the public health line is in your province. Mark, anything to add to that? No, I mean, uh, I think home monitoring is an important tool in terms of self management, regardless. Uh, both Jillian and I have blood pressure monitors uh, that we check. Um, I, I check my weight as well as, as it comes to just cardiac rehab, uh, exercise, and, and transplant. Um, and then I journal it. I, I journal as part of my regular journaling as I self-manage and then effectively manage my disease. So highly recommend that uh, you pick one up as well. Yeah, excellent. Um, there was, I think... Um, with respect to any of your medications, um, when to take them, um, there was an additional question about that. Um, I think it was about Ramapril, as I saw it was going by. Um, if you can't get a hold of your of your of your doctors, an excellent, amazing resources in our community are our pharmacists. They are absolutely incredible and very knowledgeable about um, all of the medications that we take. So um, with respect to when perhaps you can um, change the time of day if, if it, you find the medication is affecting you um, adversely, it, a, report that to, to your doctors um, and your physicians, but then also speak with um, the pharmacist about perhaps um, changing the time of um, when you take that medication. That, that, that might be um, a, a good thing to do. So I think that brings us to the end of our day, Mark. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you to everyone. Thank you, our, our amazing sponsors. Thank you to our amazing presenters. Thank you to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Uh, everyone involved, Jillian, thank you for your hard work on this. And I mean, uh, just from my perspective, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, we, we couldn't do this without you. Uh, we're here for you, you're here for us, and together we will uh, make a difference. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you as well from, from my side of Vancouver <laughs> uh, to all of our speakers today, Colleen, Gordon, Moira, Cindy, Karen, uh, and, and, and our support team at USCI, um, to Canadian Heart Failure Society. Um, Mark, my brother from another mother, um, <laughs> And to all 239, what was the last count, registrants today. Um, it was absolutely amazing, incredible having you all. I want to remind you again, we will send out um, the inf information um, uh, with all the resources that um, were collected today, how to access the, re the recordings from today's session, um, any follow-up information um, that, that, that we can offer you. Make sure you contact, go to our website, join our Facebook group. Um, and also, um, we will be sending, a, sending out a survey as well to um, collect some feedback from you. So feel free and thank you all so very much. Um, and we are done. Carolyn just commented, uh, she's still in her jammies. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Carolyn, <laughs> much appreciated. Uh, I, I, did, I do confess this is the first time I've done my hair probably in 10 days. 
Um, and it is time uh, here in BC to go listen to our dearly beloved Dr. Bonnie Henry speak and give us some uh, wonderful uh, or give us the COVID updates for today. So thank you all so very much for everything and uh, stay well, stay safe. And if there's anything you need, please reach out. We will change the heart failure landscape in Canada, but we need your help to do it. Thank you.